Okay, uh, a number of years ago, uh, Jack Isaac, he and Bill Bernstein uh, could have an informal chat as part of the agenda. And we all know that what Jack wants, Jack gets. <laughs> so it's become a, a regular part of our conference agenda ever since, and it's now affectionately known as the Barside Chat. So without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce the two participants of this non-political discussion. <laughs> I have to say that every year. Because... Okay, our distinguished guest of honor is the founder of the Vanguard Group and president of Vanguard's Mogul Financial Markets Research Center. He created Vanguard in 1974 and served as chairman and chief executive officer until 1996 and as senior chairman until 2000. He entered the investment field immediately following his graduation from Princeton University, magna cum laude, with a degree in economics in 1951. If I listed all of his honors and achievements, which most of you already know, uh, we wouldn't have any time left for the far side chat. So I'll dispense with that and ask you to please welcome our special guest of honor, Mr. Jack Bogle. Jack's companion for this fireside chat is a retired neurologist who helped co-found Efficient Frontier Advisors. He's written a number of best-selling titles on both finance and economic history. He holds both a PhD in chemistry and an MD. Please welcome one of the smartest guys I know, Dr. Bill Bernstein. It's all yours. Okay, well, uh, I have been sternly warned to uh, that any speakers who mumble will be promptly cut off. So, so please, before that happens, uh, uh, you know, start shouting, stop mumbling. Uh, I'm, I'm going to lead off, Jack, with a question uh, that is kind of a counterfactual. Uh, let's assume that it's 20 or so years ago, and the success of your concept of a popularly retail, popularly available retail fund has succeeded. You know, you've got the Index Trust 500 fund and the total stock market, and you're starting to dabble in international markets and maybe even some slice and dice in the U.S. market, and that's working out pretty well. Uh, and let's start from that point forward. What would you have done differently from that point? Are you allowed to think before you answer a question in this day in America or not? <laughs> you, have, you, you have as long as you need. Okay, but I guess if I had to do over again, what would I do differently? Uh, well, you only went back 20 years, and Vanguard was pretty much formulated almost immediately, 40 years ago, as it happens. And uh, so 20 years ago, I guess if I had done, would do anything differently, I would probably have a little less impact on marketing, be less of a marketing person. Some of the funds I started, uh, Vanguard Quantitative Portfolios was called, uh, later named Vanguard Growth and Income, Vanguard Asset Allocation, uh, which worked, Bert Malkiel used to say it'll never work, and it worked for 20 years, and then it stopped working. And I should have known that, I should have had a 25 year time horizon. And uh, so starting some funds that really probably I shouldn't have started. And we, we continue to do a little bit of that. I'm not too, these aren't my problems, because I couldn't do it any differently if I wanted to. But things like the managed, what do you call it, managed, yeah. 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 managed payout portfolio. I just, I think anything that thinks it can improve much on indexing is fundamentally, that's the, that's the burden that every fund has to have. Will it do better than the market index? And I just don't see how you can say that. On the other hand, we all have, even Bogle, after all these years of learning better, uh, of knowing better, still has too much of a marketing hat on. It's not that we need the money. My God, $3 trillion? What does that mean to somebody who's written a book called Enough? <laughs> so I'm more worried about that. But you, you end up kind of thinking, or I did, that it was a good idea to kind of preempt other people from coming into the field. So we didn't want to allow people to have something that would properly be a Vanguard show uh, with, and, 
at higher at higher prices. So we basically said we're going to start this fund or that fund, index funds of various types, um, and uh, basically say, you know, stay out of here because you're not going to be able to compete with us. I think we maybe could push that too far, and I think maybe I pushed it a little too far. But in terms of deep regrets, in terms of policies, strategies, structures, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and I just, I just plain don't have any, any, any deep regrets. Little regrets are something else again. I mean, you know, I've made so many mistakes that, uh, in my life that I tell people, my wife has forbidden me to write any more books, and I said if I, if I were to write another book, be the longest book I've ever written, and it would be called Mistakes I Have Made. <laughs> but that would go way back into my early career, when I was just so stupid, it defies description. But the, the big advantage I have, I think, is I was willing to learn from my stupidity. And we all should be able to do that. Uh, learning from your own mistakes is much deeper and more profound than learning from other people's mistakes. If somehow the lesson isn't quite as sharply drawn as to to win when you just kind of shoot yourself in the foot or in the brain or some, some other place that may be equally painful. So, uh, uh, no deep regrets. Well, that, that segues into another question, which is, should Vanguard be advertising? Well, that was my marketing hack. And uh, I didn't know how else, because we had no sales force. And, uh, how else to get the information out that we have a new fund. So we had kind of an introductory fund. I always liked to be the half page in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, if we had a new fund, we kind of told the world that we would want to do it. Absolutely laid down the rule, which we have continued to observe. No performance advertising. No yield advertising. Got it? I'm a little too far back. I didn't obey that warning. Now I can hear the echo. That's good. <laughs> so sorry about that. You missed nothing. <laughs> Um, it, it was supposed to be very modest, it was, and I have to con con concede that I wasn't too smitten with spending $50 million of our shareholders' money on vanguarding uh, our sort of campaign slogan, I don't think we need that. Well, I have conceded that you have to have a, a, a name like that with gang at the end. It's a good thing we weren't Merrill Lynch. <laughs> I wish I had eliminated advertising, because then to start advertising would be like very observable. But I did a little, and I don't think we really do a lot now. I don't know what the cost of the internet is, I'm just not familiar with that. Uh, but uh, we, we do quite a bit along those lines. And it's okay, it's not going to, the, the cost involved in terms of unit costs are really tr quite trivial. They don't change our expense ratio, an iota. Uh, but uh, I'm more into the principle of saying, um, as I did at the very beginning, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, build a better mousetrap and let the world be a path, or the world will be a path to your door. And that was how we began a long time, which we'll talk about later. And uh, so uh, I, I think advertising is not a good thing, but the limit, very limited the way we do it, it's okay. Uh, a lot of people are out there, particularly with my go go years, not the go go years, but uh, in the late 90s with all the tech funds and so on coming on. And they were advertising their returns. How would you like 40% a year? I, for one, would like 40% a year. I just don't know how to get it. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's, um, it's not as bad as marketing. Advertising is not as bad as marketing, but with marketing, when you think about it, what is marketing? Marketing is finding out what the clients want and giving it to them. And that's the way beer works. That's why we have light beer, I guess. I don't do light, I do ale, <laughs> just for the record. And uh, <laughs> rarely, sometimes in the summer. But uh, you, you're always trying to find out, and these big consumer products companies do this, or are doing this all the time, and trying to add a little bit of something to something else and sell a little bit more because that's what they think the public wants. And uh, it's a good idea for cereal, probably a good idea for automobiles and beer, and God knows what else, but I think a terrible idea for investing in the 
the great public out there usually wants the wrong thing, what they read in the paper in the last two or three weeks. Imagine how many gold funds there would be around uh, after gold had that huge run, I guess about two and a half years ago, um, maybe three, three years ago, two years ago. Uh, so, it, it, I know it sounds old-fashioned, what I, but I'd let your firm speak for itself, uh, your record speak for itself. Uh, when people start to trust you, as many, many people trust Vanguard, uh, and, uh, and, and have that the way you basically build a business. I don't think we need to worry about that again for a long time. And we have happily a formula that really, in a lot of ways, can't go wrong. And I tell people, we, we haven't promised you a fund that beat the market 15 years in a row. We haven't promised you a Magellan fund that gets to 100, gets to a billion dollars and is now about 20 million because it had a good performance and then bad money flows in and out. We're right down the middle. And as I constantly advise people, and I advise all of you, uh, we make no guarantee except we will give you your fair share of the return of any portion of the market, particularly stock and bond market, uh, that you would like to invest your money in. And that fair share means if the market goes to hell in a handbasket, your investments will go to hell in a handbasket. And uh, we should say that. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't use a word like hell. <laughs> Maybe you should too, I don't know. Going to heck in a handbasket doesn't cut it. So, um, that's, that's it. Thank you, Rob. I mean, it sort of reminds me of the famous Henry Ford uh, aphorism that if you ask the public what it wants, it will tell you it wants a faster course. Uh, um, the, uh, the, Schiller, the Schiller PDA, the, the Cape cyclically adjusted PE ratio, has gotten a lot of attention. It's uh, become a real topic of conversation, which is worrisome in itself. You know, it's still around what twenty-five or so. Uh, you know, what do you what do you what do you think of Schiller's measure? Do you think it can be improved upon? Should we not be paying so much attention to it? Well, anyone that has a formula to tell you whether the market is high or low is kidding. Either trying to kid you or has kidding been kidding themselves. You know, nobody knows this. When you take the Schiller B.E. Uh, in the last 10 years ago, uh, it was right where it is now. I think it's around 25 or 26 bill. And uh, it hadn't changed. So if, if it's giving a warning now that the market is too high, it was giving a warning then that the market was too high. And since then, the market's gone up 60%. Earnings and dividends have gone up, well, earnings have gone up, I think, 70%. Dividends have gone up 100%. So it was a false signal 10 years ago. So I look at it, enjoy it, I do. And I often use it when I go on CNBC and it's trying to deflate everybody's expectations. But there is no answer. I mean, Schiller is fun to look at, it's intelligent. Don't just look at the last year's earnings or the next year's earnings. Look a little bit of the history, but it doesn't tell you very much of anything when you get right down to the brass tacks. Yeah, I, I, I would certainly agree with that. Um, you know, if you, people are always fond of saying, well, gosh, the historical average is 16 and a half or whatever it is. But, you know, to get that number, you've got to include data that goes all the way back almost to the Civil War, which was a different, you know, era when industrial stocks were selling at four times. I mean, that, that's, that's gone. Uh, and if you look at it over the past 50 years, you simply draw a regression slope with the normal value appears to be closer to 20. Uh, so I think the value of 26 really doesn't tell you uh, all that much. Well, let's let's ask, shift gears a little bit, get into some personalities. Let's let's go to the sunglass question, uh, which is uh, that you know there've been star managers for forever, starting with what Ivor Kruger and then Jerry Sy and you know through the Peter Lynch and Bill Miller and now uh, another guy. I'm wondering, do you think the public has, has learned anything, or do you think that the birth rate is higher than the learning curve? <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem with this business is it has a kind of distribution arm that has to sell something. And if you want to talk about, you've got a client out there, and you want to sell them a certain thing, it has to have a good performance. 
And there's nothing else really to show them. You know, say, well, our expense ratio is only 10 basis points instead of 100. I think your client is thinking, duh, what does that matter? Uh, particularly since the 100 doesn't even cover what the fund spends on the transaction costs, marketing costs, and things of that nature. So uh, I, it, it's, it's an action business. Investment advisors uh, basically feel a need to tell you to do something. Uh, portfolio managers, and I keep thinking of it, and, and this is an interesting point, I keep thinking of Peter Lynch, manager of Magellan Fund, going in to see Ned Johnson on January 2nd of a given year, and he says that Ned, or Mr. Johnson, uh, I looked at my portfolio, and I think it's fine for the year, and I'll see you a year from now. I'm not going to do anything one year. The odds are 51% that that will improve the fund's performance during the year. It's improved. And all that transaction, it costs money, uh, and it it, 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 sometimes it adds value, but more often than not, it's so tax value and its returns. But the portfolio manager, and people are saying, what are you doing? You've got to be doing something. And you know, turn off all those, well, I won't get into the scandal we have about our Pennsylvania judges and their, their pornographic emails. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. But um, it, it, you, you feel the need to do something. Trustees of an endowment fund feel the need to do something. Uh, investment advisors feel the need to do something. Financial advisors, or RIAs, feel the need to do something. And uh, I'll give you one little anecdote. I was speaking out in Milwaukee a few years ago, and I went through my little patois of bonds and stocks to keep the ratio right, and don't do anything else. So one of the financial RIAs in the room comes up to me afterwards and said, look, I know your advice is right. But think of me a minute. Think of me, not yourself. <laughs> he said, I've got a client. And he comes in, and he set up his portfolio, and he's 65% stocks, 35% bonds. And he comes back a year later. And he says, what do I do now? And he said, nothing, nothing. And he said, I guess that's okay. to go a whole year without doing anything. Comes back a year later. He says, I must be doing something now. I didn't do anything last year. How about this year? Don't do anything. <laughs> comes back a year later. This is now the third year. i got to do something now. This is just crazy. And the advisor says, no, stay the course, stay exactly where you are. And he said, the client then says to me, what do I need you for? <laughs> How do I answer that question? And I said, the answer is easy. Just tell him you need me to keep you from doing anything. <laughs> and there really is, and we make fun of it. But uh, it, there's a lot of truth in that. This is a business where... Activity is big, never been higher than it is today. I mentioned the spider thing turning over at that awful rate. And uh, it traded, I guess I mentioned this to Christine Benz earlier. The spider traded $160 billion in the last five days. And the assets of the spider are $160 billion. It's a five-day turnover of 100%, an annual return over of 5,000%. And I'm the kind of person that thinks 3% of turnover is kind of pushing him on the high side. <laughs> and there's a big difference between 3% and 500, 5,000%. So the, the trading environment obviously enriches Wall Street and impoverishes, therefore, the investor. So that's why State of Course works. Yeah, there's, there, there was a, a wonderful uh, front line from about 50 years ago uh, that featured tech funds. The, hot tech funds in the late 90s, and there was about a 30-second clip of Garrett Van Wagner, who was a famous tech fund manager at the time, with one phone in each hand, shouting orders to each phone, and it, 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 even then it just gave me the willies. I thought there's, there's something something wrong here. Um, all right, well, let's let's shift uh, gears a little bit here and talk about some ladies. Uh, and the first lady I want to talk to you about is, is Mary Jo White. Uh, I, I have a, we talked about this last night, um, I have an odd sense of disquiet about her. You pointed out that she is a prosecutor uh, and uh, you would hope that she would perhaps use those skills in her job. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that's a good, a good, necessarily a good fit for her skills. I think that the job of you know, being the SEC commissioner is a, uh, Chairman of the SEC is a more has a more broad moral 
ambit, if you will. And I'm wondering if you have that same sense of disquiet about her. Well, I think she was clearly brought in uh, with the idea, at least a major part of the appointment, uh, leaving aside the fact that most administrations really want to have more women in them, and most of them do these days, is that um, she's a prosecutor, a tough prosecutor, uh, A. And B, she knows Wall Street. She's been lawyering there for, I don't know, 35 years or something, 40. And uh, so and in that sense, she was a, if the mission is prosecute, get people in jail, uh, get big penalties, um, and she, she was a good choice. And unfortunately, that's a very narrow, as Bill says, a uh, very narrow version of what the SEC does. They're there to protect the consumer, the investor. And it's gotten to be a big, complicated business. They are, they are outgunned at every level by you know, these quants, uh, by the high-frequency traders. I don't know who the SEC can out-talk the high-frequency traders about that complex business, which is probably not a bad business. It's got to be regulated more. But the speed in the markets, and they they had tremendous lead times. And then she's also affected, and, and people have done very little talk about this. I talked a little bit about it at the Senate Finance Committee when I testified there and on September 16th as their lead witness. And uh, it was about the retirement system. But I was talking about regulation. And the Dodd-Frank law itself, as well as the Department of Labor Regulations, are allowed to impose standards of fiduciary duty on everybody involved in the system except the people that manage money. How could that be? I mean, they're not allowed to, to impose a standard of fiduciary duty on money managers, in either case. That's ridiculous. That's the most important fiduciary, the most important toucher of other people's money around, but she, she can't go beyond what the Congress gave her, so I'm trying to make a little excuse for her. I think she's integrity laden. I think she's maybe over her head as an administrator of this huge agency. And I think she must struggle each day with figuring out there's so many things going on in the system. She must be struggling. I don't know who she has that's really good in terms of division heads. I'm not so good. I think the guy that's running the mutual fund division, and he's okay, but not a hellraiser like the ones I used to work with. We used to get along famously. I don't even know this guy. But on the other hand, I'm not the preeminent figure anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I expect too, too much when I look out at the brokerage industry and the investment company industry, I see a moral swamp. Uh, and I keep waiting for the person who's the SEC chairperson to, to deal with that. And it, it just never happens. Uh, you know, Mary Jo White, I think, takes a very legalistic, narrow view of things and says, is the law being broken? And the problem is the law itself, unfortunately. The law itself doesn't make it illegal most of the activities that I think exercise uh, Jack, Jack and myself. Um, well, uh, I'll bring another lady in, and this is so political that I don't want uh, Mel to hit his ejection button, so I won't even mention her name. Uh, but, but this woman, uh, who's a very prominent woman, has said that uh, the President of the United States cares more about Wall Street than about Main Street. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think that's true? No, I don't think so. And we are wrapped up in an outrageous political system where there is so much going, so much money coming out of Wall Street. And you even get somebody, a Democrat like Chuck Schumer, who is, I think, I'm sure you want which committees he head up down there, but he could do something about this outrageous, this is a really good example, of this outrageous tax treatment legislatively, in which hedge fund managers get their returns at capital gains rates and not ordinary income rates. He's a Democrat, he should be for that. But where's, where does the Senator Schumer get all this money from? Wall Street. So even the, cons even the liberals in Congress don't dare to take on the hedge fund industry. And I think that's wrong. I think that's tragic. Uh, and uh, I think Obama has talked a little bit about this, but he, he's limited by the university's uh, regulations around him. And he, he too was supported, was supported by Wall Street, that seems to be fading quite a bit. Uh, I'm not sure anybody's supporting him now, which probably means he's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> think about that for a minute. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think he's against the individual investor at all. More in favor of Wall Street than the individual. He's, uh, 
He's got the right values. He seems to maybe be, as the conventional wisdom tells you these days, maybe as a politics here, maybe too deep a thinker and not strong enough an actor. And uh, you know, I'm not a deep enough thinker and too strong an actor, so we're somewhat contrasted there. Okay, well, um, let's, let's back up again a little bit, this time only uh, six years. I mean, you know, if, if I could back up uh, 30 years, and I think if anybody in this room could back up 30 years, what we would have done is obvious, which is we would have purchased, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft with the IPO and the to the beach, with an investment in Vanguard funds. Uh, so, you know, with, with that benefit of, of hindsight, uh, let's go back to September 15th, 2008. Uh, and, you know, you have the two biggest, uh, two of the biggest financial corporations in the world that either are going to go bankrupt or about to go bankrupt. How would you have handled it differently? Obviously, it was handled tolerably well. Knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently? Well, I mean, I'm not an expert in why the Fed and, and uh, New York Fed, particularly the Secretary of the Treasury, did what they did. But I think they did what they could do. Uh, you know, they're limited. I happen to believe the stimulus package was the margin. There was no, as, as emerging from the uh, litigation between Hank Greenberg and against AIG or against the government's treatment of AIG, there's no question that the government had to do something and they were on the edge of bankruptcy. Whether they did it perfectly, whether people like Goldman Sachs were protected from taking haircuts on the, on the paper they had with AIG. You know, I wondered about that then and I wonder about that now. But, uh, you know, I wasn't there. You had to take into account a lot of things. In the, this, this financial system that lubricates basically everything we do in the U.S. starts to fall apart. So, particularly under pressure, I don't think you could have done any better. Sure, little things might have been done better. But uh, I think they had to let Lehman go. Those arrogant guys up there. Uh, pretty disgraceful the way they handled the finances of that firm. And uh, they were not the only ones. And I also thought the money market people got off very, very lightly with faking their asset value. Uh, what was it called? Institutional money market or something. Reserves, yeah. Uh, and uh, so there are there other things that they might have done better, but that ended up in litigation and the government just didn't win the case. And it's always hard to win when you're outgunned with a lot of high-priced lawyers. So I think uh, in, in an imperfect world, uh, that system, whole financial crisis was handled as well as it could be. And I think that increasingly comes out of the reading of testimony. I guess it's now over uh, on the AIG trial. Yeah, I mean, Gene, Gene Fama did a very interesting interview about a year ago with Jeff Summers in the, uh, in the New York Times. And he said he would have just nationalized the banks then and there. And Jeff Summers, you can almost see his jaw drop. He said, that's not, a, not exactly the answer I would expect from a Chicago libertarian. And uh, on Helms Brown, he said, yeah, that's, that's what, I, what I would have done. And you know, the interesting thing about that reply, I think, is, is that it would have avoided a lot of the political uh, out, you know, fallout. Uh, people who were angry that the government bailed out Wall Street uh, and, and not Main Street. Um, something else we chatted about briefly last last night, Jack, is um, you know obviously uh, we live in a world now that uh, is a uh, it's a DC world. It's a defined contribution world. The DB pensions, the old traditional pensions, are slowly going uh, away. Um, was that a mistake? So that was, 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 was the shift from DB to DC, uh, defined benefit pension plans, traditional pension plans, to defined contribution plans a mistake? Well, it's not a mistake conceptually, because that's the way the world is going. Corporations want that pressure off their uh, P&Ls, uh, but it's given us a system that is not working well at all. It's moved the whole shift of risk from the corporation, which can handle it, presumably, over to the investor, most of whom cannot handle the risk. And we try to turn a, the bank, a, a savings plan, a thrift plan, into a retirement plan. And if you have a retirement plan, I've written a lot about this, talked about it down at the Senate testimony. You have to have, you can't take money out of your retirement plan whenever you want. You can't borrow from it. 
Think of what would happen to Social Security if you could do all those things. You wouldn't be working for anybody. You know, the wife needs a new rug. There goes your retirement. <laughs> Too bad. Pity. <laughs> and uh, so it's basically the defined contribution system is what we're faced with, what's going to grow. I can even see the states and municipalities going from defined benefit. And the uh, governments, state local governments, are the biggest, uh, by far the biggest, uh, defined benefit plans. And they're going to eventually, I think, go to all well, the labor unions there are so, so strong uh, that it's going to be a hard thing to do. But the, the economics fit that. We've got to make a much better defined contribution. Very difficult to withdraw. Only allow low-cost funds into the system, maybe even only index funds. Easy for me to say, but the fact of the matter is, if all these defined contribution beneficiaries together, I think it's around $5 trillion worth, own the stock market as a group. But if they're trading with each other back and forth and buying this fund and that fund and selling others, they're not going to do nearly as well and they're paying high costs. So we have to have those kind of elements in the system. And we have to have more of a mandatory contribution Right, right now, a corporation can just drop out, so I'm not going to pay you anything this year. That's usually, by the way, when the values in the market are the best they're going to be in a long time. And if they do this when markets are low, and uh, because that business is low, so it's a lot of fixing. Oh, I will say this. I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was doing there was a 60-year legacy party seminar for a day in the Museum of Finance in New York about a year ago, and. Uh, year and a half ago, and uh, I did an interview with Paul Boker at lunch, and it was a television journalist, I can't remember who it was, who interviewed it, and she asked me what I thought about Social Security, and I'd say the same thing about uh, the defined benefit, defined contribution plan. I said, look, it's got to be fixed, and the fixes are simple, it would barely be noticed, maybe not for a long time, maybe not forever, small changes in cost of living adjustments, a small change in retirement age, um, a higher minimum deduction, salary cap, 115,000, maybe 135,000 or something, which would really hit only very few people. And uh, I said, uh, if you would make all of these czars of the Social Security plan, I would say czars of the defined contribution plan too, we'd fix it in an hour. And Paul, Paul said, couldn't we fix everything? <laughs> <laughs> and I think we probably could, or at least think we could. I want to turn the tables on you a minute, Bill, because I've got a couple of questions for you. <laughs> um, I was hoping to avoid that. But, uh, okay. I'll list your, go ahead. And, and the line of my questioning comes, it, it has to do with the markets. And that is we can all look at Schiller PEs and regular PEs. And we can always look ahead to earnings, which I'm quite confident are quite forced. Uh, and then we'll do I'll talk a little bit of that later on. But I was inspired after thinking about the staggering risks that we see out there in the world today that the market seems to totally ignore. You know, you've got this terrorism going on in the Middle East. The Middle East is more, in, more unstable than it's ever been. I think even more unstable than Lawrence Arabia had for that matter. And, uh, but for a long time, a tribal society, a very religious, in the name of religion, great crimes are being committed. Uh, you know, this awful thing where you know, someone being beheaded is somehow a worse thing than someone being shot in the head. I'm not sure the victim cares that much. Uh, but uh, that's frightening. Uh, the increasing intransigence of China and the slowing of growth in China, apparent slowing of growth. Another problem. Ebola doesn't look like a big problem because it doesn't seem to be able to be transmitted like the, I guess we had the bird flu a few years back, which was really a dangerous thing because it got everywhere. Uh, but disease, unprecedented, unpredictable things. The weakness in the European economy, uh, particularly important in the global world. So there are all kinds of huge risks out there that the market uh, is, it seems to be ignoring as far as I can tell. So my question to you, what I did was that when I thought about this, what, what could I ask Bill? I didn't realize he was going to take all my time <laughs> asking me. Um, was I got out a copy of his book called The Investor's Manifesto. And it says, preparing for prosperity, Armageddon, 
and everything in between. <laughs> and uh, so I immediately went to the index and looked up Armageddon. It wasn't there. <laughs> and so I, I, you know, I, I thought, Bill could tell me what's going to happen. And what I'm describing is almost an Armageddon kind of a, all these risks converge, almost kind of an Armageddon scenario. So um, what do you say about Armageddon? Well, first of all, that, that word in the subtitle is all Bill Falloon's fault. Um, uh, yeah, I finally figured that out when I bought it in the index. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he said, how does this sound to you? And I said, sure. You know, <laughs> sounds, sounds, sounds good to me, whatever sounds. Uh, uh, but, you know, more, more seriously, I think that human beings are prisoners of saliency. Uh, uh, you know, the image of someone having their, their head cut off, uh, the mental image of somebody bleeding out from every orifice from a horrible disease that you really can't treat, uh, those are things that really get our attention. Um, but I think if you were to go back into a time machine to say 70 years ago, when we were staring down the likes of Hitler and Stalin, uh, or even, you know, 50 years ago, when uh, you know one man really saved the world from being incinerated, it was a man by the name of Vasily Yakupov, who was a uh, commissar on a submarine who prevented the, his his uh, commanders from pressing a nuclear button on that submarine. Uh, you know, it's a name you should look up because uh, it's an interesting story. I think if you went back and you told the people, you know, 50 or 70 years ago, that the biggest threat we have now is from people who want to go back to the 7th century and can't even manufacture their own bicycles, uh, I think they would have laughed at us. I think that the problems that we're facing now are trivial compared to, 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 those, to those problems. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why expected returns, why prices are so high, and why expected returns are lower. Now, the other reason why that's the case, and has nothing to do with risk, is simply the fact that there's a lot more capital and this is a complex subject, but you know, if you go back 5,000 years, nobody had capital, okay? We were, we were talking about subsistence level societies, and when people needed capital, they needed to you know, buy farm implements and buy seed, so that the one person who had capital could get an enormous price for it, all right? And then as societies become wealthier, that, that physics, if you will, changes. So the richer a society becomes, the lower the returns, and maybe the returns we're going to get really aren't commensurate with the risks. Uh, I think that's right. I think the problem is not that risks are so high. I don't think they are high compared to the world of 50 or, or 70 or 80 years ago. I just think that the returns are so low commensurate to the relatively small risks that we have. Uh, you know, that's something that, that, uh, that I was going to ask you about, but I'll, I'll, I'll comment upon and maybe get a response from you, Jack, which is that, and I'm sure you'll talk about this more later on this morning, is if you look at the expected return of a prudent mixed portfolio, a 60-40 portfolio, it's lower than it's ever been in human history. Uh, you know, zero return on real return on bonds, maybe a 3 or a 4% return on stocks. That's not much more than 2% real return on your, your capital. Uh, and that, I think, is really the, the worrisome thing for people who want to uh, retire. You've got this squeeze, if you will, between lower returns and then people are going to be living longer. I'm looking at some of the younger people in this audience and you know, you're going to be 100. Uh, and if you want to retire at age 55, you better... What do you mean only the younger people are going to live to be 100? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about populistic sense. Uh, they've got a better chance than, 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 than I do, that's for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they want to retire at age 55. Well, maybe the people in this room will do it, but not many other people will. Well, the, 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 the interesting thing is that we see, whatever, whatever it is we see, I have to be really concerned about the state of the world today. And I don't quite myself know what to do about it. I mean, I could go heavily into cash. As always, I'm, you know, roughly in this day and age, probably 60% stock 65, something like that, counting all the different accounts I have. My retirement plan would be higher, that's my biggest asset. And uh, my personal account would be lower. Uh, but personal account is mostly intermediate term unis, 
So I'm happy to be there as well, as happy as I could be this year as I've ever been, you know, an 8% return, most of which is tax-free, is not to be sneezed at. So, uh, but I still puzzle about the big risks that are undefined and out there somewhere. And that kind of a situation basically doesn't get a, a response to the stock market. And uh, whether it should or not, I mean, I, I happen to know one particular investment advisor who has all of his clients, has had for years, 60% in short-term treasuries. And he says he knows the event is coming, and he's got to be ready, he's got to protect our assets, that they have to give up a few gains, or a lot of gains, in the search for, for uh, uh, protection when the great day, or the bad day, or the evil day comes. Uh, well, that's the way it is. Now, I'm not sure that's a viable strategy. I think his clients would get you know, a little you know, wondering if he knows what he's doing. But if you're ahead of the crowd, people are always going to wonder uh, what you're doing. So I don't have any answers to it either, but I do think that everybody in the room, I would feel very guilty if I didn't kind of warn everybody that this, uh, this is a risky, risky world we live in. And uh, you know, I don't know what to do about it except a reasonable conservative position. Uh, and if Armageddon is, let tell people, if Armageddon is having a some kind of a foreign object strike the meteor, strike the U.S., well, it won't matter whether you're in stocks or bonds. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> or, to put a little top on that, I've repeated this in a different context earlier, uh, we all know the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but it never quite gets there. It never quite gets there. So, I, I, I think you should be aware of risk. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what to tell myself to do about it. When I start to panic, I would just read one of my books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jack. And thanks, Bill. And uh, we're going to take a short break now. And in 20 minutes, Jack will start his uh, conference.